This is all I got. This is all I got. Don't take my baby, okay? I've been, I've been away from my baby for two months. I just want my baby. I just want my baby. I'm at $13,000 a month. What more do you want from me? Hey, dog, boy, your ass came. For those of you who don't know, pyrolidamide, or KX826 as its drug code name, is a non-steroidal anti-androgen developed by Suzhou Kintor Pharmaceuticals, a pharmaceutical company based in China. Pyrolutamide is being developed with the aim of treating androgenetic alopecia, also known as male or female pattern baldness, and it's also in the works as a possible acne treatment. Pyrolutamide functions by selectively binding to the androgen receptor, which theoretically reduces the effects of DHT, which we all know contributes to conditions like hair loss and acne. Pyrolutamide is in phase 3 clinical trials for hair loss and phase 2 for acne. Its strong affinity for the androgen receptor ensures targeted action and is generally well tolerated, with contact dermatitis as a common side effect. So with that recap, what happened recently? Well, on November 27th, 2023, which, might I add, is the birthday of my favorite late great actor and martial artist, Bruce Lee, rest in peace, Kintour made a press announcement on their website, primarily updating their investors on the progress made in phase 3 clinical testing of pyrolitamide for androgenetic alopecia. And this news, understandably so, was met by many with disappointment, because it essentially stated that pyrolitamide at a concentration of 0.5% not seem to increase hair count and thus hair growth. So let's review the details of the document for this phase 3 clinical trial testing for pyrolitamide. Now, I must say, we do not have the actual clinical data. This is just a statement that Kintor is putting out. We don't know the exact percentages in which hair counts increased in both placebo and control groups. This is just Kintor's press announcement, so we need to wait for that additional detail to come out, which could be sometime early to mid-2024. Anyway, the Phase 3 clinical trial of KX826, also known as pyrolitamide, for treating androgenetic alopecia is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study. So what does all that mean? Well, a Phase 3 double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study is a pivotal stage in clinical research designed to rigorously test the efficacy and safety of a new treatment. In such a study, double-blind means neither the participants nor the researchers know who is receiving the actual treatment and who is receiving a placebo, effectively eliminating bias in the interpretation of results. Randomized refers to the process where participants are randomly assigned to either treatment group or placebo group, ensuring that two groups are comparable and that the outcomes are not influenced by pre-existing differences. A placebo is an inactive substance that looks like the treatment but has no therapeutic effect, serving as a benchmark to measure the true effect of the treatment. Controlled indicates that the study is conducted under standardized conditions with a control group receiving placebo. Overall, this type of study is considered the gold standard in clinical trials, as it provides the most reliable evidence on the effectiveness and safety of a new treatment by minimizing bias and ensuring rigorous testing conditions. So here, the treatment group is the group that is receiving pyrolitamide or pyrolitamide at a 0.5 concentration, and the control group is the placebo group, the group that is receiving this substance that they apply topically, but essentially it doesn't have any sort of drug inside of it. It's like water or aloe vera gel. Bottom line, it's supposed to not induce hair growth in these subjects. So at the end, you can sort of compare the two groups to see if the pyrolutamide group is performing better than the placebo group, the group that isn't receiving any drug, that means that 
Pyrolutamide is effective in slowing down, stopping, or even reversing androgenetic alopecia by way of increasing perceived terminal hair count. So Kintor Pharmaceuticals announced that while the trial demonstrated that pyrolutamide promoted hair growth with statistical significance compared to baseline, which is the point where people started before treatment, its effectiveness did not show a statistical significant difference when compared to the placebo group at all evaluation points. Now, why is this an issue if Kintor just told us that in the group that was treated with pyrolidamide, they had more hair in the end of their study compared to the beginning? The issue isn't comparing the pyrolidamide treatment group's endpoint hair count with its starting point, but rather... It's the fact that Kindor says that between the placebo control group and the pyrolitamide treatment group, there was no difference in hair count, or there was no statistical difference in their hair counts. You see, when a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study reveals that there's no significant difference between the treatment group and the placebo group, it suggests that the treatment in question may not be effective than the placebo group. And like I said in the beginning, the placebo group is essentially getting a substance that has no therapeutic effect. You can pretty much think of it as just water. So allow me to reiterate, the placebo group is getting something put on their scalp that's known not to do anything at all. This suggests that the treatment group, or pyrolitamide, the group that is receiving pyrolitamide, may not be more effective than the placebo. This outcome necessitates a critical re-evaluation of the treatment's efficacy, potentially promoting adjustments in the formulation, dosage, or even administration methods. Additionally, such results can have substantial implications for regulatory approval processes and the commercial prospects of the treatment. Researchers might want to explore varying concentrations or combinations of the treatment or even consider alternative therapeutic approaches while pharmaceutical companies might face decisions about whether or not to continue or halt the development of pyrolutamide based on these findings. Now, this observation is particularly noteworthy as it suggests that despite some efficacy within the pyrolutamide treatment group's endpoint hair count being greater than its starting point, pyrolutamide at a 0.5% concentration might not be markedly more effective than the placebo at this specific trial setting. What we can see from Kintor's own words is that it was once again observed to be safe, such that pyrolitamide is a safe treatment, and that's a positive outcome that we have to keep in mind. However, the lack of a significant difference in hair count when comparing placebo is critical, because this is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So if the results point to pyrolitamide underperforming, that means essentially either it's the molecule itself that's ineffective, or it's some sort of compounding issue where Again, that 0.5 concentration might be too low, or maybe somebody messed up in the formulation process. In general, Kintor has to go revisit the drawing board and really make sure that they're standardizing their processes. And the strange part about all of this is that the outcomes of the phase 3 results contrast with the phase 2 clinical trial results, where in phase 2, there was a statistical significant improvement in hair count observed between the treatment group or the group that received pyrolutamide compared to the placebo group, the group that received an inactive substance. So again, really big discrepancy here, and it's just making not, I would say not pyrolutamide overall look ineffective, but maybe the 0.5 concentration is what is ineffective. So let's not jump the gun here. Kintor mentions in their announcement that they will continue to do a new phase three testing to see if they may gain further insights on what the issue might be. I find that given pyrolitamide's high molecular weight of 482.43 Daltons, its skin penetration efficacy, a crucial aspect for topical treatments, becomes a significant consideration. Now, this is where the principles of Fick's Law of Diffusion and the 500 Dalton Rule in Dermatology come into play. 
It is generally accepted in dermatology that as molecules approach 500 Daltons, their effectiveness in penetrating the skin becomes greatly reduced. Likewise, this effectiveness decreases even more as the molecule becomes larger than 500 Dalton. Now, it doesn't mean that the absorption becomes zero, but depending on how thick someone's scalp is and other compounding variables, this could affect how well a molecule is absorbed into the skin. The 482.43 Dalton of pyrolytamide, although below the 500 Dalton rule, is still pretty large. Depending on how Kintor compounded their pyrolytamide solutions, it could simply be the case that at the 0.5% concentration, as well as the higher subject count in phase 3, clinical trial testing highlighted how ineffective and perhaps diluted the concentration of pyrolytamide is. I mentioned before Fick's Law of Diffusion. Fick's Law of Diffusion, a principle in physics and chemistry, is key to understanding the effectiveness of dermatological treatments. It explains how substances, like topical medications, move from areas of high concentration to lower concentrations, influencing their absorption into the skin. This law suggests that the diffusion rate depends on factors like the concentration difference between the medication on the skin's surface and its inner layers, the surface area of application, and the distance the substance must travel. Additionally, the size and solubility of the medication's molecules play a crucial role in determining how well they penetrate the skin. In essence, Fick's Law provides insights into how a cream or ointment or some topical medication applied to the skin is absorbed, highlighting the importance of formulation properties in the design of effective dermatological treatments. Now, we know that pyrolytamide has a high affinity to the androgen receptor with an IC50 of 0.28 nanomolar. As a reference drug, bicalutamide has an IC50 of 3.1 nanomolar. For additional comparison, the topical experimental antiandrogen RU58841 and testosterone have near equal affinities for the androgen receptor at an IC50 of 1.1 nanomolar. And this is stated by Pan et al. in the paper titled, quote, The Effect of RU58841 on the Androgen Receptor, unquote. Now, if you don't know what IC50 means, I'll tell you. IC50 is a term used in pharmacology to measure how effective a substance is at blocking a specific biological process. You can think of it like a scoring system where a lower score, or in this case, a lower IC50 number, means that the substance in question is more effective in stopping or blocking some sort of biological process. When it comes to substances like pyrolidamide that act on androgen receptors, which are proteins in the body that respond to hormones like testosterone or DHT, a lower IC50 value means that the substance in question is very good at binding and blocking to these receptors and stopping their action. In this case, we want this to happen in the scalp so DHT doesn't bind to the androgen receptors of the hair follicles. So, theoretically speaking, because pyrolidamide has a lower IC50 value compared to other substances like bicalidamide or RU58841, this means that it should be more effective at this particular task of binding to androgen receptors and blocking DHT from destroying hair follicles that are sensitive to DHT. And we know that at least at the 0.5 concentration, that pyrolidamide is safe and does not go systemic preventing issues like low testosterone. And there isn't any particular reason that higher concentrations would do the same thing. But nevertheless, I think the only saving grace here would be to do another study, another phase three clinical trial at 0.5% versus 2%, 5%, and even 8%, just to see if increasing the concentration of pyrolytamide will give better results. And I want you guys to consider RU58841's concentration that we typically see. In many studies, RU58841, also known as PSK3841, is used at a concentration of 5%. We see this being true in both animal studies and what we know of the human clinical trials of RU58841. And from what we do know about the human studies from phase 1 and phase 2, significant improvement to hair count was observed with RU58841. We just don't have the complete safety profile for it. 
And likewise, this can be said about the stump-tailed macaque monkeys, which are a close human relative in terms of animal studies. So if we are ever to do an animal study involving hair loss, these monkeys would be our best bet because they too experience androgenetic alopecia and are primates like we humans are. Not only that, but I want to draw attention to the molecular weight of RU58841. RU58841 has a molecular weight that is considerably large at 369.344 daltons. Although this is less than perilitamide's 482.43 daltons, and it definitely is below the 500 dalton rule in both of these cases, RU58841 is nevertheless a decently sized molecule that exists at a relatively high concentration. The same idea must be applied to pyrolitamide to see that if at greater concentrations its side effect safety holds true in relation to its efficacy increasing total hair counts, especially the improvement of terminal to vellus hair ratios. So what can we take away from all of this? It seems that perilitamide has underperformed in the recent phase 3 clinical trial as Kintor put out in their press release. Despite what online trolls have been saying like on Reddit stating that Kintor is officially dropping the drug, Kintor mentions that it will continue testing and investigating to see if perilitamide is a legitimate and effective treatment in fighting androgenetic alopecia. Pyrolitamide has a high affinity for the androgen receptor higher than RU58841 and testosterone, and potentially being around DHT's affinity. Not only that, but the drug has been proven safe in Phase 1, Phase 2, and also Phase 3 clinical trials, all showing to have no severe adverse systemic side effects, like an extreme drop in serum androgens like testosterone and DHT. However, pyrolitamide maintains a relatively high molecular weight at 482.43 daltons and may benefit from higher concentrations as per Fick's law of diffusion and the 500 dalton rule in dermatology. Kintor should look at experimenting with concentrations higher than 0.5% pyrolitamide. The concentrations should be, potentially, right, around 2%, 5%, and perhaps even 8%. Now, there is another upcoming and more extensive phase 3 safety trial in China, once again, testing pyrolitamide at 0.5% concentration. This new phase 3 trial is expected to provide additional insights on the safety and perhaps efficacy of pyrolitamide. So whatever happened in this recent phase 3 trial that was put out, perhaps researchers can learn from that. Again, maybe it is the fact that the concentration is a bit too low. Nevertheless, we do have to wait for this entire phase 3 clinical result to come out, which again might be in the beginning of 2024, so we can see the percentages of change within the perilitamide group and the placebo, just to see how quote-unquote ineffective or statistically insignificant, I guess you can say, perilitamide is. But yeah, I think we need to slow down and not lose our cool we just need to make sure Kintor actually does do the 0.5% versus 2% versus 5% versus 8% versus placebo, whatever, uh, clinical trial. Like, we need something like that just to see if it is truly concentration. Because the IC50 scores speak for themselves, and it does show that pyrolitamide does have a high affinity for the androgen receptor. So, I hope I didn't just repeat too many things over and over again, but I like to reiterate the point for people in the audience so they can understand what I'm saying and just have the ideas that are in my mind solidified to them. But thank you so much for watching. Comment in the comment section below, red star, if you got this far. And thank you guys for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Peace out.